Hey YouTube, Ethan here. Today we're going to talk about radiation and radbolt production and oxygen not included. If you've only ever played the base game of oxygen not included without the spaced out DLC, or if you're a brand new player to oxygen not included and you bought the spaced out DLC, then radiation will be entirely new to you and this video is for you. In this video, I aim to present you with all the effects that radiation can have on your duplicants and around your base. It is critical for getting to the mid-game portion of your playthrough because you're going to need it for research. But beyond that, you can use it for other things as well, such as the interplanetary launcher, which is going to be more of a mid to late game playthrough build. So we're not going to focus on something like this or something like the research reactor. We're strictly going to focus on how you can get started with radiation and we're going to go over those more advanced builds in a space theme tutorial instead. In Oxygen Not Included, you can produce radiation in multiple different ways, and the objective is to capture that radiation using something like the Radbolt Generator. The Radbolt Generator is then going to produce what's called a Radbolt when it reaches a certain internal target that you set, and then that Radbolt can be utilized somewhere in your colony. When you first start, you're most likely going to be using Radbolts for the Material Study Terminal, and this is going to be important to help you advance through the tech tree. When a Radbolt is fired from something like the Radbolt Generator, it's going to leave in the direction that you set, which you can see in the Radiation Overlay screen. This overlay screen can look quite complicated at first, but it's really no different than piping or ventilation systems in your playthrough. Each building or terminal is going to have an inlet, which is identified in white, and an outlet, which is identified in green. For most of the outlets, you can change the direction of travel for the Radbolts. So for instance, we have this Radbolt Generator, and if we want the Radbolt to be shut up, we can do so, and we have to aim it towards an inlet of something else. In this case, it's a Radbolt Reflector. This Radbolt Reflector will send the Radbolt that it captures through to another Radbolt Reflector and then into my Material Study Terminal. The reason you'd want to build something like this is because Radbolts are very contaminated with radioactive activity. And if they cross paths with where duplicants are going to be walking, it can injure your duplicants and eventually incapacitate them as well. Likewise, having your duplicants exposed to too much radiation, depending on where you're creating that radiation from, can also cause your duplicants to become incapacitated. So with that being said, you want to always make sure that your duplicants are avoiding radiation exposure as much as possible, or the direction of Radbolt travel, because obviously you don't want to be losing their production just because you sent the Radbolt through the path that they would likely to be traveling on. When you set up a Radbolt generator, you're going to tell the Radbolt generator when to fire the Radbolt. The minimum setting you can have is 50, and you can have it set all the way up to 500. This Radbolt up here left the generator at 50 units, and as it travels through the atmosphere, it loses Radbolts for every tile that it crosses. You can see at this point in the travel, it's at 48.7 Radbolts, so just in this short distance alone, it's already lost 4% of its mass. And if I slow the game down and try to pause it again, you can see that just before it enters the Material Studies Terminal, it's now 48.1 Radbolts. So you ideally want to have your Radbolt production very close to where you want to use your Radbolts, because if you have them traveling over a very long distance, they're going to lose units very quickly. Now, a Radbolt generator is just one way that you can generate Radbolts. As you can see on the overlay screen, it's always going to be used near something that is emitting radiation. In this case, I'm using an infinite storage method for housing liquid nuclear waste, and if you want to learn more about infinite storage methods, you can see the video that is on the top right of your screen right now. And this infinite storage method will enable you to generate almost infinite amounts of Radbolts per cycle that is only limited by how much liquid nuclear waste you have access to. And because I'm in sandbox mode, I have access to as much as I want. So the Radbolt production where this Radbolt generator is, is around 1400 per cycle and climbing. Another very common method, and this is a lot more practical, is producing radiation with Weezwer plants. And if you have Weezwer plants stacked in a situation like this, you can have up to 950 or 1100 Radbolts production, depending on where you put your Radbolt generator. Now, the only downside to Weezworts is that if you domesticate them, they do require fertilization in the form of 4000 grams per cycle of phosphorite. But if you have your pips plant them, you can get them for essentially free and you get cooling along with it. So while they're not extraordinarily at cooling, they can certainly help keep the Radbolt generators at operating temperature and from melting over the course of your playthrough. Another source of radiation, of course, is space. Now, with space, you obviously don't have a lot of radiation production, but if you don't have access to Weezworts or liquid nuclear waste, then this is certainly an option. But you only get around 72 rats per cycle, and that's even if you go up very high. Now, if you go past the bunker doors that you would normally build, it's going to be around 125 rads per cycle, which is still not very much, considering how much it takes to fire a rad bolt from one of these rad bolt generators. So while radiation exposure is definitely one of the most common ways to produce rad bolts, there's also another method that does not require radiation exposure, and that's the manual rad bolt generator. However, for the manual rad bolt generator, you're going to need either enriched uranium or uranium ore, 
and this is something that your duplicants are going to have to operate manually. The upside to the manual Radbull generator is that it requires absolutely no power, versus the Radbull generator itself requires 480 watts of power, which is quite significant if you're just starting your colony and you need access to those Radbolts because you want to advance the tech tree to build something unique. Now, it's also worth noting that the manual Radbull generator does produce radiation in and of itself in its surrounding area as your duplicants are working. But this is typically not enough to make your duplicant sick. If we pause the game, you can see that we're averaging around 6 to maybe 70 rads per cycle, which is considered to be mostly safe by the tooltip. If you go onto the overlay of your duplicants, it's going to show an absorbed rad dose line, and this is going to tell you how many rads your duplicants have been exposed to. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, how do duplicants get rid of the radiation that they have been exposed to? And you're looking at this solution right here. Duplicants can get the rads that they've been exposed to out of their bodies by using lavatories. So it's really as simple as that. If you have access to coal, you can also produce the basic rad pill, and this is going to help alleviate some of the radiation exposure that your duplicants take if you don't have access to protective gear yet, and you need to send them into highly radioactive areas. Now, it's not going to be a 100% method to stop radiation exposure altogether, but it is going to help somewhat if you really need to use this. But when it comes to anything in oxygen not included, the best preventative methods is to just keep them from being exposed in the first place. You definitely don't want your duplicants around this area at all, so if you have domesticated weasel plants, you might want to consider using something like an auto sweeper with a conveyor loader in order to feed the phosphorus, so that your duplicants don't have to come into contact with this radiation, which poses them a significant hazard according to the tooltip. And of course, this is even more dramatic if you're housing liquid nuclear waste inside of an infinite storage chamber, because this is going to give your duplicants maximum hazard of radiation, and they'll almost certainly become incapacitated very quickly. So the best method is to keep them away from the radiation exposure altogether. If you're specifically using radbolts for something like the material study terminal, it's going to be able to store 100 radbolts for your duplicants to use. One of the overlooked downsides to this is that when the 100 radbolt requirement has been met, the radbolts will simply continue to go past it and travel in whichever direction that they were traveling without being intercepted by the material study terminal. So if you have your radbolt shooting from left to right or from right to left, this is going to continue going forward until it depletes fully or hits something that has radiation blocking that stops it from traveling, as you just saw right here with this radbolt. This means that if you have duplicants working in this area, and you have the Red Bull traveling from the right to left, it's going to come into contact with these duplicants and injure them. So it's something that you definitely want to avoid. So you just saw the Red Bull hit the floor there, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. One of the ways that you can alleviate this is by using automation, just as with most things in Oxygen not included. The material study terminal will send the green signal when the storage is full, so if you want to shut off your Red Bull generating equipment, you're going to want to transform that green signal into a red signal using a NOT gate. So once I shut off my signal switch, and the Radbull generation stops entirely. This causes Radbull decay rapidly inside the Radbull generator because the Radbull generator is not able to maintain the Radbulls that it's collecting. The manual Radbull generator, on the other hand, stops entirely and there's no adverse effects from it. So this is a great way to not only save on power, but to save the Radbulls from traveling randomly throughout your base without your control. Of course, another method can be storing your Radbulls inside of a Radbull chamber. This Radbull chamber will store up to 1,000 Radbulls, and you can use this option screen to tell it how many Radbulls it's going to fire when it receives a green signal. The green signal can be as something as a signal switch, but you can make it a lot more elaborate in your own playthrough depending on your needs. In this case, if we want the Radbolts to fire from this Radbolt chamber, we simply flick the switch and Radbolts will start firing. The Radbolts coming from the chamber can use the exact same reflectors that the Radbolts are going to flow in. So we mentioned earlier that the manual Radbolt generator produces Radbolts from enriched uranium and uranium ore. Enriched uranium is something that I spawned here because this is sandbox mode, but what you're more likely to find on your asteroid during your playthrough is a biome like this that is just full of radiation. Now your duplicants can probably come in here and mine it without any problems because the radiation that they're going to absorb from this area is not going to be significant enough to cause them injury. But even still, you might want to keep an eye on them if you're digging through a very big area like the one you see here. Digging through smaller areas though shouldn't be a problem at all. Of course, you don't want to have to sit here and monitor your duplicants every time they need to dig out uranium ore from one of these biomes. Instead, you can build yourself lead suit docks, which can house lead suits for your duplicants to wear, so they're able to dig through an area like this much more conveniently without being exposed to so much rads. So if we set up a dig errand here, you can see the duplicants are all going to rush in, put on their lead suits, and come and start digging. And this is going to allow them to be exposed to significantly less radiation than they would be if they weren't wearing these lead suits at all. For the most part, the lead suits will get the exact same benefits as the Atmos suits do. Here are the stats on the screen for the Atmos suits, and the major difference that you're going to notice is the athletic rating. The athletic rating for the Atmos suit is minus 6, and the duplicants get an excavation buff of plus 10. 
If we go to lead suits, however, that athletic rating changes to minus eight, and instead of getting an excavation buff, they're going to get a strength buff instead. The suits function very similar to ammo suits, and they even require oxygen intakes, just as the ammo suits do. Which as you can see, I forgot to connect. One of the final methods that you can use for radiation production is the radiation lamp. Once I turn on the signal switch, the auto sweeper can load the uranium into the radiation lamps, which will start generating a significant hazard amount of radiation that the radbolt generator can then use to produce radbolts or whatever you need in your colony. In this case, I'm using a radbolt joint plate, which works similarly to any other joint plate in oxygen not included, such as the heavy watt conductive wire joint plate, and it will allow radbolts to flow through otherwise solid buildings, such as tiles. Most materials in the game, such as the sandstone tile, are going to produce radiation blocking, which will not allow the complete radbolt to go through if you're not using the joint plate. This works just like any other radbolt reflectors. It has an inlet and an outlet, with the exception that you can't aim this in the same way that you can a radbolt reflector. When it comes to radiation blocking, all materials in oxygen not included have some form of radiation blocking, including liquids. For liquids such as polluted water, you can find this stat under the properties tab when you click on the polluted water itself. When it comes to solid tiles, this radiation blocking can be easily viewed using the radiation overlay. Now the radiation across all these tiles is a little bit different, but we can see how much it's going to block just by hovering over the top and the bottom of the tile. And this is obviously in the space biome, where I'm already having a little bit of blocking done by the bunker doors. So if you had a regular sandstone tile, we go from 54 rads to 24 rads, which translates to a 50% blocking in radiation. An insulated tile, also made of sandstone, also blocks 56% of the radiation. So in this case, we have two different types of tiles, but they're both blocking the same amount of radiation. This metal tile made out of steel blocks 59%, this one out of copper 49%, and the one from lead is 68%. So if you have an area like this where you're producing radiation using Weezword plants, you might want to consider building something as simple as sandstone tiles, because this is going to block a lot of the radiation, so your duplicates can work in the surrounding areas. And of course, you can double this up and add more layers which is going to contribute to more radiation blocking. So now that we've gone over the basics of radiation and rad bolts and how they can be used for your playthrough, let's go over how radiation sickness affects your duplicants. In this room, I'm going to drop a duplicant in and they're going to be exposed to whatever radiation that the shine bugs and the masses of uranium ore are creating. In this case, 1000 kilograms of uranium ore plus the shine bugs are going to be producing about 100 to 200 rads per cycle for your duplicants. So we dropped in Quinn and she's eventually going to be exposed to enough radiation to make her a little bit sick. I gave her an outhouse and some food because this level of radiation takes quite a while to affect your duplicants. So you can see that even in the significant hazard areas, she's only absorbed 65 rads in total so far. And it's been about a half a cycle since we've started this. It just goes to show how resilient your duplicants can be to radiation, so you can indeed have them mining out some of your radiation biomes without too much consequence. She just went to the washroom and you can see that she deleted 115 rads from her body. So now her absorbed rad dose goes back down to zero because she was able to relieve herself entirely of that dose that she got in this room with the outhouse. Okay, so this is taking a little bit too long. Let's go ahead and drop in some significant amount of radiation. As we increase the mass of the tiles that we're dropping in, her radiation exposure increases dramatically. She's already absorbed 100 rads and it hasn't even been a half cycle yet. When we cross the threshold of 200 rads, then it's going to get minor radiation sickness. This is going to cause her stamina to decrease by 25% per cycle and her bathroom use speed by negative 30% as well. Okay, so we just crossed around 600 rads and Quinn has reached major radiation sickness, which gives her negative four to athletics, negative 50 to stamina, and still minus 30 to her bathroom use speed. At this point, going to the washroom no longer depletes all of the rads that she has absorbed, and eventually she's going to start puking. If we keep pushing the limit of how much radiation Quinn can absorb, she's eventually going to become incapacitated, but not before continuing to vomit because of her radiation sickness. Quinn has now reached extreme radiation sickness after over 1200 rads absorbed. This gives her negative six to athletics, negative 75 stamina per cycle, and still negative 30 bathroom use speed. At this point, Quinn has become pretty much useless to our colony, which is going to reinforce just how much radiation can affect your duplicants if you don't take care to give them proper protection during your playthrough. Eventually, Quinn becomes incapacitated due to the radiation, and this happened for me at around 1800 rads. Now that we've stopped punishing Quinn, we can finish the rest of the video. I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial on radiation and rad bolts in oxygen not included. Dealing with radiation is no different than dealing with extreme heat temperatures. Both can harm your duplicants if they're exposed for a long enough period of time. 
so be sure to treat it with the attention and detail that you would with anything else in your playthrough, and they'll be fine. If you made it this far in the video, it would mean a lot to me if you gave it a rating, as this would help more people in the algorithm be able to see the video. And let me know down in the comments below if you were able to learn anything from this tutorial. Just a reminder that I will be covering more advanced space builds, such as the Interplanetary Launcher, which requires the use of rad bolts, in a space-related tutorial. I thought those would be out of place for a tutorial like this that is catered towards beginners, because generally, when you're new to the game, you're just focused on surviving and utilizing the radiation instead of trying to get to space. So we'll cover all that in due time. Until then, if you have any suggestions for video ideas, feel free to leave them down below in the comments. I try to read every single comment that I get across all of my videos, although it does take some time because as I produce more videos, I get more comments. So it eventually becomes a time issue with how many of them I can get to. I take your suggestions for videos very seriously, so if you have any topics that you'd like me to cover, feel free to leave them down below, and I'm going to get to it as soon as possible. I hope that in the future I'll be able to do live streams and I'll be able to interact with you guys a lot more. So let me know down in the comments if that's something that you'd like to look forward to as well. And thank you to those who have been subscribed to me for the many months since I've started the channel. It has been so much fun for me to produce these videos and to get them out to you guys because the overwhelming positive reaction that I've been getting just makes me want to continue to produce more and more videos. And I love covering all the topics that you guys suggest down below. So until the next one, I'm Ethan and I'll talk to you guys later.